Well, good evening to all again here gathered in. Uh, so if this is your first night, I just want to give you a very warm welcome um, and thank you for coming out tonight to hear the gospel message. Uh, now, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to uh, Daniel, Daniel, Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 5, and we're going to begin our reading tonight at verse 1, and then we're going to go over to the New Testament and, and take a reading out of there as well. So Daniel chapter 5. And beginning to read at verse 1. Belshazzar the king made a feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father or his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. And they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. Paints a very vivid picture for us of this man, Belshazzar. Then go down to verse 22. And we'll read to the end of the chapter, and then we'll go over to Matthew, Matthew 27, verse 22. And now his son, O Belshazzar, Daniel's speaking now, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords thy wives and thy concubines, and have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in, in whose hand thy breath is, listen to that little phrase, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast, not, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and his writing, the writing was this, or, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written, Meme, Meme, Tekel, Eupharson. This is the interpretation of the thing, Meme. God hath numbered thy kingdom, and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances, and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided, and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. And Darius the Medan took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. Then turn over to Matthew's Gospel, 27, verse 45. Matthew's Gospel, 27, verse 45. Needless to say, if you haven't got a Bible with you tonight, you'll just listen to the reading of the Word. Matthew 27 and verse 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani. 
That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it, put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And we'll just end the reading there. Now before we begin, let's just pray God's blessing upon his word. Father in heaven, we draw into thy presence again, in and through the name of our dear Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, if we had read on in that chapter, we would have seen that the, the veil was rent from top to bottom. The way was made for sinners to come into the holiest place of all. And Father, we thank you tonight for those of us who are saved by the grace of God, washed in the precious blood of the Lamb, and bound for whom. And Father, we thank you for your word. You said the entrance of your word gives light. You said, Father, you've set your word above your name. And Father, we pray tonight that your word would speak into the hearts of men. Father, we ask that the word would come with the authority of God tonight. Oh, Father, I pray as men would gaze upon the pulpit, they wouldn't hear the words of man, but they would hear the words of God. And so, Father, we're asking thee tonight in sovereign will to come and have thine own way. And be pleased, O oh God, to do whatever thou wouldst want to do. In thy precious and worthy name. Amen. Now, if you'll turn back to Daniel chapter 5, and you'll be able to follow with me along down through the chapter as we go through the story. You see, we find here in the chapter we've just been reading that this man, Belshazzar, was the next king of Babylon after his grandfather. Here was a great nation, a great kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold in the image that was so vividly portrayed for us in the chapters previous. And then this young man, Belshazzar, comes along, his father being the grand, his grandfather, or his grandfather being Nebuchadnezzar. And here, Belshazzar, he takes the throne. And now Belshazzar, he's sitting on the throne. He's, he's the king of all Babylon. And I'm sure that filled his heart full of pride. But you see, Belshazzar was a carbon copy of his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. His heart was full of wickedness. He was a ruthless man. And his life was characterized by rebellion against God. You see, this story of Belshazzar begins and ends in chapter 5. And God in his will and in his mercy and in and, and his foreknowledge, he's decided to take us and show us a picture of a man called Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5 so that he could warn us of his hand of judgment. You see, Belshazzar created and, and committed an outstanding act of rebellion towards a holy God. And this was Belshazzar's last chance. I think that's one thing that could be so evidently seen as we read through chapter 5, is that God is giving Belshazzar one last chance. One last chance. And I wonder tonight if there's an unsaved soul in the meeting. I just wonder tonight if this will be the last chance that you will hear the gospel message. The last chance to get right with God. The last chance to come in repentance to Him as a sinner beneath the cross of Calvary and give up and say, Lord, I need to be saved. You see, I wonder will an unsaved soul in the meeting die tonight? Let that sink into your mind. I wonder, is there an unsaved soul in the meeting tonight and you will die? And it's very true that you could go out those doors tonight and you could die physically. I think that, that frightens us all. That a sinner that's not saved could go out through the doors of a gospel mission and they could die physically. But imagine if you were to go out those doors tonight. And you weren't to die physically, but something within your soul died spiritually. Imagine this was the last night God spoke to your soul. And something within the soul died spiritually. 
And can I say to your unsaved soul, if you go out them doors tonight and you live for another 30 years, but your spiritual soul has died, you're already in hell. You're as already as good in hell if you go out those doors tonight and God stops speaking to your soul. And you never get a chance to hear the gospel ever again. You might hear it many times, but something in the soul, something in the heart is hardened. And God has closed the door. And although I said this was Belshazzar's last chance, if we read down through this chapter, we see very clearly that God knew Belshazzar wasn't going to repent. God had already decreed in his foreknowledge and in his sovereign will that this was Belshazzar's last chance, and God had quit him. And he was heading to a lost eternity. A lost eternity. And you see, as I look at this man, Belshazzar, tonight, as I read down through this chapter on many occasions, there's a few things I want to say about Belshazzar that I think can be very clear about the, the unsaved person. You see, in verse 2, we can see the barrenness of, of Belshazzar. You see, the very fact that Belshazzar threw a great banquet and a great feast for a thousand of his lords speaks to me of barrenness. His life was completely and utterly void of anything. You see, Belshazzar was empty. Belshazzar was void. And here he makes a great face to a thousand of his lords and he thinks this is going to be great and he's going to have all the fun and all the party. But there's something within his soul and he's so barren. So barren. You see, he had it all. He had the, the fun, he had the games, he had the women, he had the wine, he had the money, he had everything. He could have all a man would have dreamed of or wanted. But he was barren. And maybe you're in the meeting tonight and there's an aching void within your soul. You've tried everything. You've been to every place you can go. You've done everything that is possibly conceivable known to man, but there's still something within your soul and you're barren. You're trying to cover up the fact that you don't have Christ. You don't have Christ. You see, not only was Belshazzar barren, but Belshazzar was bold. Verse 3. He brought out the vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God which were at Jerusalem. If we were to go back to chapter 1 of Daniel's prophecy, we would get the story of Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, going into Jerusalem that day and going into the temple and ransacking it and taking part of the vessels and, and bringing them back to Babylon. And then on the third exile, without going into too much detail, all the vessels were carried from, from, from Jerusalem back over to Babylon. And here's this man, Belshazzar. He goes in and he gets all the vessels, all the golden vessels, all the, all the great and the, all the mighty things that were taken out of the temple, out of the house of God. And he brings them into this great big banqueting hall. It must have been some size. To hold a thousand people. And here he arrays all the banquets, all the banquets out, and all the vessels is out, and all the food is out. And he's all the holy things in the house of God, and all his idols are in there too. And they're having a great time. And I can see the boldness of Belshazzar as he brings out all the holy things of God, and as he mocks God. And he stands before a holy God and he says, I'm the king of my own life. I'm the king of my own life. He had an irreverent attitude towards holy things. And maybe tonight, dear unsaved soul, you're not only barren, you're trying all the things of the world and they can't satisfy. But maybe you're bold. Maybe you have an irreverence to holy things. Maybe you just make light about God and, and His truth and about the creation of the world. You see, Peter tells us, talking about the creation of the world, them men are willingly ignorant. Willingly ignorant. They're willingly ignorant against the truth of God. The truth of God that is seen in creation. The truth of, truth of God that is seen in all the things around the world in His Word. And the very fact that He is a testimony to His name. And there's so much irreverence in the world today. So much mockery towards God. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're mocking God. 
Maybe there's a boldness in your heart tonight, and God will have to shake it out of you. And I believe he will. You see, I believe Belshazzar, I believe Belshazzar prayed it about that banqueting hall. Maybe with the high priest's garments on. Maybe he walked about and he made fun of the God of Israel. Maybe he marked all the rituals and all the things that they followed. And lo and behold, did Belshazzar know God was going to speak to him that night? And maybe, dear unsaved soul, before or prior to this meeting, you've marked God in your heart. You've marked God in, in not repenting. You've marked God in His Word. You've marked God every day without Christ. You're marking a holy God. You're making the work of the cross just a disgrace. And lo and behold to you, maybe tonight would be the last night God would speak to your soul. You've marked God for the last time. The last time. You see, Belshazzar was barren. He was bold. But Belshazzar was blind. Verse number four. Got all the vessels out and done all that he had to do and drank wine in them and then he praised the gods of gold. And of silver and of brass and of iron and of wood and of stone. I wish you could get a picture tonight of the banqueting hall Belshazzar was in. All the holy vessels of God on this side. And the candlestick there, because the verse tells us that God wrote over the candlestick, and it was probably a few of the candlesticks that were taken out of the temple. All the holy vessels on this side, and all his idols on that side, and Belshazzar's in the middle. He's in the middle. He was blind to his need of Christ. Maybe you're blind to your need of Christ. He was blind to his need of God. Blind to the fact that he had rebelled against God. And tonight, dear unsaved soul, you're blind to your need of Christ. Blind to your need of Christ. And I would say if you could make a decision for Christ tonight, I would say maybe there's something within your soul and you're longing to be saved. And you're longing to come to a knowledge of sins forgiven. But you can't do it. You can't do it. Unless God comes down in all his power. Unless God comes into the meeting and he takes the blindness from off your eyes. You'll never be saved. You can say what you want. You can do what you like. You can go where you want. You can do all the things that you want. But unless God wakes the dead. You'll not be saved. You'll not be saved. And here's old blind Belshazzar. Blind to the fact of God. Blind to the fact of God. And I think without hesitation, it's a wonderful picture of the sinner. Wonderful picture of the sinner. Barren in their need for Christ, nothing will satisfy. Bold because they would dare to live another day without Christ in their life. And blind because the God of this world has blinded them. Blinded them. You see, it says the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. It's not that he's blinded the heart or it's not that he's blinded the memory or any of those other faculties of our being. He's blinded our minds. Blinded our minds. And there's nothing more blind than a man or woman who sees their need of Christ but does nothing about it. Would it give you a thought tonight? It'll not cost you anything. To think about where you'll spend eternity. It'll not cost you anything to take two minutes just now as I speak. And think about death. It'll not cost you anything. Think about death. Barren, bold, blind. It's taking men and women to a lost eternity. Taking to a men and women to a place that God calls hell. God's hell. And you might say to me tonight, preacher, I don't know. You might say to me tonight, preacher, I, I didn't know I was lost, and, and I didn't know I was going to hell, and, and I didn't know there was a Christ who loved me, and I didn't know there was a Christ who died. And that's not my fault. Imagine you're walking down. Imagine we turned out the lights in the tent just now. 
We waited at 12 o'clock night until everywhere was pitch black, turned out the tents, not a peep of light, you couldn't see a thing. And you started to walk down through the tent and there was a great big hole at the end of the tent. Oh, it was a million feet deep. It was a bottomless pit. And you started to walk down through the tent and, and you started to make your way towards the hole and you fell in and you, you, you never came out again. You know, that wouldn't be your fault. But imagine you're walking down through the tent and there's a great big hole at the end of the tent and someone comes in and they, they turn on the light and they start to illuminate the hole at the end of the tent. And you start to see you're heading for the great pit. Is it your fault then if you fall in? Yes, it is. And there's so many men and women across the world tonight and they're headed to the great pit. And God has turned on the light. God has sent his son Jesus Christ who is the savior of the world and the light of the world. And you know what the sinner does? Rich reaches up and turns off the light. Switches it off. Switches it off. You see, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Their nature is evil. Oh, they're hell bent towards God. Born into the world with an enmity against God. Born into the world with the, the selfish hand that would try to rip God off the throne if they could. The old sin of Satan himself. I will, ex I will ascend to the hill of God. I will exalt myself. I will, I will, I will. All about self. All about self. You see, the thing about Belshazzar is this. God wasn't going to let Belshazzar get off with his sin. Wasn't going to do it. And to use some modern slang, God gate crashed at Belshazzar's party. He really did. Belshazzar having all the fun and all the friends and all the family and all the drink of the world, all at his fingertips. All at his fingertips. And God just came in. God came in. Look at verse 5. In the same hour, in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over it against the candlestick. There it is, upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the hand, saw the part of the hand that wrote. So he didn't see a figure, he didn't see anything else, but he just saw a hand come out starting to write upon the wall. And it says the king's countenance was changed. And his thoughts troubled him. You see, God will not tolerate prideful, willful sin and rejection of him. I believe with all my heart that there's only so long God can stand. There's only so long God will give a sinner a chance to hear the gospel. Whether you believe it or not, I believe it. That God's spirit will not always strive with man. You could hear the gospel a thousand times and spurn God's grace for the last time. And it could be tonight. You see, we're living in a world today where men love their sin. And you take a look at men and women across the world, and I would say, out of it all, the greatest sin is pride. It is pride. It's pride. Pride before a holy God. And there's a wee verse in Isaiah, and it says this. It says, the witness or the show of their countenance doth witness against them. They declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. And I believe men and women today, the show of their countenance doth witness against them. They don't care. They declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. Men aren't afraid to, 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 to flaunt their sin before God anymore. They're not afraid. There used to be a time when men had reverence for God, they don't now. Maybe tonight you're flaunting your sin before God. The show of your countenance doth witness against you. You hide it not. You're not ashamed of it. Not ashamed of it. And God just stepped in and he shook Belshazzar in his shoes. In verse 6, we've already read it. And I believe with all my soul that God is shaking someone tonight. He's trying to get his grip on you. And he's shaking you. He's shaking you. He's shaking you like this microphone holder beside me. He's really shaking you. 
And in verse 6, it tells us that his thoughts troubled him. His thoughts troubled him. You see, Belshazzar had a conscience after all. Despite all his wickedness and despite all his sin, he had a conscience after all. And maybe you're fighting your conscience tonight. Maybe you've come to the meeting tonight just to see a face. Maybe you've come to the gospel meeting tonight just to please a, a wife or a husband or a daughter or whatever it might be. And you're saying to yourself, oh, if I could just hold on for another 15 or 20 minutes till the preacher gets finished, I'll get out and I'll silence the voice of God. And maybe your conscience is troubling you tonight. Maybe like old Belshazzar, as the writing was on the wall and his conscience was troubled. Your conscience, man, it's pricking you sore. That's the Holy Ghost, it's the Holy Spirit. And you're just saying to yourself, oh, I'll just wait for another 20 minutes or 15 minutes or however long the preacher will be, and then I'll get out again and I'll be able to let loose. Oh, friend, you're in a fearful position. You see all I've said about Belshazzar? He was barren and he was bold and he was blind. He was reckless. He was full of pride. He was drunk. He profaned God. You wouldn't have thought he had a conscience at all. But yet when God came in, Belshazzar shook. Oh, he's a big man before his friends, but when God came in, he shook. He shook. And there's no one tonight too drunk in sin that God can't sober up. And there's no one tonight too far away from the convicting arrows of God. You can't hide. You might jump down in your seat and you might try to squirm and you might try to get away from God, but you'll not do it. You can run, as they say, but you can't hide. There's a gold Adam there in the Garden of Eden. He ran and he hid, but he couldn't get away from God. Adam, where are you? Where are you? God knew fine well where Adam was, but he wanted Adam to know where he was. And my soul cries out tonight, dear unsaved soul, where are you? Where are you? God wants you to realize you're lost. Ever get troubled about your soul? Ever get troubled about your soul? Ever think, where will I spend eternity? Old Belshazzar, he was troubled. And Belshazzar realized that God was real. And God was trying to get through. Trying to get through. See if you look over there at verse 22. We're coming down into the final portions of the scripture. You see, the whole thing about it was this, was God was reminding. God was reminding Belshazzar that he was God. And all I've said just tonight, even as we open up, is this. I'm just trying to remind you that God is God. Just trying to remind you as I remind myself as I preach that we have all fallen short of God's glory. And we need a Savior. God reminded Belshazzar and God won't send the sinner to hell without giving him ample warning. Romans chapter 1 tells us we're left without excuse. Without excuse. No excuses before God. He doesn't want to hear them. We didn't read it in verses 7 to 21, the middle part of the, the chapter. But if we could say God was reminding, well, we see Belshazzar remembered. Belshazzar remembered something. He remembered the faithful servant, Daniel. He remembered that Daniel was a man that was revered when Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, was on the throne. And how Daniel, he, he interpreted those great visions in chapter 2 of the great Colossus. And how he was a young man who, who had, had said it within his heart that he would not sin against God. And now Belshazzar remembers the man of God, remembers Daniel. And he calls for Daniel. He calls for the man of God. And you see, unsaved soul, this is it. See, when God convicts you and your conscience is troubling you, a doctor won't do anything for you. And when you're under the conviction of God, a psychiatrist won't do anything for you. And when you're lying in bed at night and you're sweating because you know the conviction of God is on you, there's nothing in this world that will ease your troubled conscience. But God can't. God can. 
God can if you get right with Christ. And so Daniel, he comes and Belshazzar speaks to him. And if Daniel, if God rem reminds Belshazzar that he is God, and if Belshazzar remembers about Daniel and he calls him, well, here Daniel comes and he reveals. He reveals. Look what Daniel has to say in verse 22. Daniel reveals something to Belshazzar. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart. You see, there's the pride again. A pride of living your life without Christ before a holy God. Pride. You've not humbled your heart, Belshazzar. And look what he says. Though thou knewest all this. You see, there's not one man or woman unsaved in willful rejection of God, knowing they need Christ, that doesn't know that they're lost, and doesn't know that they're, they're willfully rebelling against God. You know it. You don't need anybody to tell you. You know, you're, you know you're rebelling against God. You know it. You know it with all your heart. You have not humbled your heart before God, though thou knewest this. Already. Already. But hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, etc., have drunk in them. And look what he says. I've already read it. And the God in whose hand thy breath is. You see, the only reason why you're in the meeting tonight is by the grace of God. He is God. And the only reason why you're in the meeting tonight is because God has allowed you to be in the meeting. Praise God. Because God holds within his hand the breath of your soul. He does. And if God holds our souls and our breath within his hand, he has the authority and he has the right to let you go whenever he wills. Do you realize your breath is in the hand of God? Do you realize that God created you? He lifted up Adam in the Garden of Eden and he blew into his nostrils the breath of life. God placed the soul within man, an eternal soul. And if God gave man a soul, God has a right to take it away. And Daniel's making sure Belshazzar knows this. When Belshazzar stands before God at the great white throne judgment, ah, he'll not have any excuse. Daniel told him, Belshazzar, God holds your breath in his hand and he can take it away at any moment. Any moment. Verse 24 says, Then was the part of the hand sent from him and this writing was written. You see, God, through the preacher tonight, as weak and feeble as he is, is trying to reveal to you your heart, need of Christ. And here Daniel, he comes and he reveals the meaning of the writing. And it's the same for you tonight, dear sinner. That's where we get that little saying, the writing's on the wall. Because tonight for you, dear unsaved soul, the writing is very definitely on the wall. You might not be able to see it, but it is through the Word of God. God doesn't need to come down tonight with a, a hand and write your writing on the wall. He's given us His Word, and that's just as powerful. That's just as powerful. Now, if I could apply God's judgment to Belshazzar, to some unsaved soul tonight, it would go like this. We get the first one in verse... 26. This is the interpretation of the thing. Meme, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Ever heard the saying, God has numbered your days? Your days are numbered? Well, maybe tonight God is saying to some dear unsaved soul, your days are numbered. Your days are numbered. And if you're in the meeting tonight and by the grace of God and you're not saved and you're over the three score and ten years, well, your days are numbered. You're maybe ten years in the borrowed time. And the clock is starting to tick and God has set a time and he's patiently waiting. And you're not moving. You're not moving. Your days are numbered. 
Your days are numbered. All our days are numbered. God sets up the beginning and he sets up the end and he does everything in between and it's all of God. All of God. Then in verse 27 he says, Tekel, thou art wed in the balances and art found wanting. You're found wanting in the great scales of God. If God was to set his scales down into the tent tonight and he was to set you on it, you'd be found wanting. Found wanting in the holiness of God. Found wanting without Christ. Found wanting in the balances of God's justice. Then in verse 28 it says, Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Your life will end tonight. That's what Daniel said to Belshazzar. Belshazzar, your life will end tonight. And God forbid there should be some soul in the meeting that has spurned God's grace for the last time. And God's saying to you, sinner, your life will end tonight, physically or spiritually. Physically or spiritually. And I always say it's one of the one things that fears me the most. I, I don't want to use it as some tool of evangelism, God forbid. But it's a clear teaching of God's word. There was old Felix in the New Testament. Felix heard the gospel message for the last time because we don't read anything else about him later on. And he went out, and uh, if we were to believe tradition, as I said last year in the mission, says Felix took his own life. That was the last time Felix heard the gospel. And he died, not shortly after. You see, what conviction was under and over Belshazzar? What a message to receive from God. We're all standing here tonight, maybe sinner as well, and you're saying, Belshazzar, why didn't you repent? It's so clear. You got such a word from the Lord. And you rejected it. Look at Belshazzar's reaction. This amazes me. It amazes me. Because this could be your reaction. This could be your reaction. Not only was Belshazzar barren. It was barrenness. And not only was there boldness in Belshazzar's life. And not only was there blindness, but see in verse 29, there was deafness. Deafness. Look at verse 29. After Daniel proclaims his judgment upon Belshazzar, in verses 26, 27, and 28, what does da Belshazzar do to Daniel? Read it for yourself. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, and put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Belshazzar never listened to a single word Daniel said. Didn't listen to a single word he said. He was barren, he was blind, he was bold, and he was deaf to the voice of God. Never even listened to a word Daniel said. Just went out and set Daniel up as a third king. Just never, just write it off all he said. After the troubled conscience, after all the sin, after the convicting message, just made Daniel the third ruler of the kingdom. Went on about his business. You see, in verse 30 it says, And that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. He missed his chance to get right with God. Missed his chance. And dear unsaved soul, you have more light tonight than old Belshazzar ever had. More light. Belshazzar wouldn't repent. And in an act of judgment, God took Belshazzar off the face of the earth that night. But you know, friend, praise God. Not only did God remind Belshazzar, not only did Belshazzar remember, not only was there a great revealing of Daniel, but see tonight for the unsaved soul, there's a remedy. There's a remedy. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and the Lord Jesus Christ has shed light upon your path tonight, I believe it without a shadow of a doubt. He shed light upon your darkened soul that you're heading to a lost eternity and you need to get right with God. You see, the same night, in the same night, in that night, was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. But I turned us over there to Matthew 27. And what it says in Matthew 27? In the same hour was Jesus, the king of the Jews, crucified. In the same night was King Belshazzar slain. And then in the same hour was Christ, the Son of God, lifted up on Calvary. A few hundred years later. Was it for my sin? Was it for his sin? It's for my sin. It's for my sin that Christ hung upon the cross. It was for my sin he bore my iniquities and he died. He took my sin and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary. And he suffered and he died alone. See the difference? One king died because of his sin, but the other king died for sin. Both of them are kings, but Jesus was the king, the king of kings. One king had to bear his own hell for all eternity. The other king took my hell for me, but there had to be repentance. There had to be repentance. There had to be a turn in my life. There had to be a change where I acknowledged my sin before God and I was destined to a lost eternity. And then Christ took my place. Hallelujah. Upon that old rugged cross. If I will put my trust in Him for salvation, He'll give me life. He'll give me life. You see, this is the only remedy for sin. It's Christ. It's Christ. It's the Lord Jesus. And tonight you're going to have to make a decision. And as old C.H. Spurgeon says, you're not, you're not going to make a, a decision based on your own will. But it'll have to be a decision based on revelation. It'll have to be a decision based that Christ has revealed himself to your needy soul. And you need to get right with him. You see, just now, you're standing in Belshazzar's shoes. Just now, dear unsaved soul, unbeknownst to you, you've been placed in the shoes of Belshazzar. And it's now over to you. You're going to go out again tonight and spurn God's grace for one last time. God forbid we should come to the mission tomorrow night and someone say to us, such and such sadly has passed away in the night. Gone out into a lost eternity. It's a fearful thing. It's a fearful thing to come to a mission and go out unsaved. And there Christ and all his love and all his mercy coming in all the splendor from heaven's glory living that perfect life dying that perfect death rising again from the dead and today he's alive alive that men and women are able to come and put their faith and trust in him Tonight he's calling you. He wants you to get right with him. Friend, don't be going out of here tonight unsaved. I want this message to haunt you when you sleep tonight. Just you think when you're going to bed tonight and you close your eyes, I'm going to pray that God haunts you and God hounds you, and God convicts you, no matter how hard your heart is, no matter how much you care, no matter how much you give, you even give two hoots. 
God will convict you of your sin. And he will save you. You've been running for too long. And God's giving one more chance. Don't be like old Belshazzar. You heard the message and experienced the conviction and had a troubled conscience and and had all those things revealed to him and, and yet tonight Belshazzar's in hell. Christ is standing with outstretched arms. He's saying, come. Come. And he will give you life. Let us close in prayer. Maybe in the stillness of the tent tonight. God has been speaking. God has been challenging your heart. It's all about God. Father, we ask tonight that you'd come in. And you'd have your own way in this meeting just now. You said faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Father, we've done our part. We've tried, Lord, to be as faithful to your word as we could. We're asking thee, Father, to come and do what thy wilt. Father, that you'd be pleased to save souls tonight. That you'd be pleased to leave men without excuse. That you'd be pleased, Father God, to hem sinners up. No way to turn, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Nowhere, no how to get out of the conviction of God. Father, we're asking you tonight to do something that man cannot do. Lord, we've accomplished so much at times in our own names. We can do so many things, Father. We can erect a tent. We can organize the speakers. We can get the music, Lord, and all the rest of it. But, Father, we can't save a soul. Father, we're giving thee our praise and our adoration and our love for what you've done in our lives. Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for revealing to me my need of Christ. Father, we pray tonight that you'd come down and you would do something, Lord. Father, we're lingering in expectation for a move of God. Father, we dare not, we dread not close up the meeting, Lord, ere a soul go out into eternity without Christ. Oh, Father, we don't want to. We don't want to say amen, Lord. We don't want to leave, Lord. We long for you to move. Father, speak tonight in your own blessed name. We're just going to close with the words of, in fact, we'll not sing anymore. We'll not sing anymore. We'll just, in silence, uh, maybe just make your way to the door. If the Lord has spoken to you or challenged you or in any way you'd like to speak to us, please make it known.